snackarligt om hur som jobbar, hur som jobbar som komponist och kan inspirera av och hur som jobbar som lärare vid Ingrid Akademiet. Han har faktiskt blivit professor i fjol. Så han startade som tillsammans med CC 2018 och så blev professor i 2019. Riktigt, ja. Vi kommer ta samtalen på engelsk, men jag tar den informasjonen på litt sånn på norsk. Han har en introduksjon på at dere har en gang i dette, så snakker vi litt sammen. Og så kommer vi til å åpne litt opp for spørsmål på slutten. Hvis det er litt tid, har så ikke lenge med skrandre. Ok, så merci både Daniel, jeg står her og følger med på presentasjonen. Takk for introduksjon, og takk Jon Olof, Stina, Ida, Vilde, for at du fikk dette seminaret, og skjer opp for ditt harte arbeid. Tusen takk. Det er flott å være medlem av Norsk Komponistforening, og å presentere på dette seminaret. Dette foredraget er basert på en foredrag jeg holdt i Brasil i 2015. Derfor skal jeg fortsette på engelsk. Så Stina først asked me to talk a bit about being in Bergen and how I view the composition situation there and also the contemporary music situation and to compare this uh, to various other experiences I've had. Um, so I'm very happy to be in the city, which is very small, but has an extremely strong tradition of contemporary music and contemporary music activity. And it's really nice in Bergen that the various organizations actually work together uh, so that people are very cooperative. Um, so, uh, in this slide, I will talk a little bit about my background as a composer and then go on to uh, talk about reflections about composing today and especially composing today in Norway. In introducing how I compose, I often show pictures of Budapest. This is a city where I grew up to introduce how one might listen to a piece of music. We see on the top Budapest in 1900. Underneath, we see the city in the year 2000. A piece of music can also embed material from various historical epochs. A composer deals with creating new musical material. The research component lies in creating innovative materials and forms. Simultaneously, composition can be a way to investigate the past and carry it forward into the future. Ethnomusicological transcription is important for me as a composer. Bartók, the great-grandfather of ethnomusicology, remains an example for me. Bartók, who undertook systematic analysis of folk music, from Eastern Europe, North Africa, Turkey, and other places of the world, was the first composer to make such a comprehensive analysis of folk traditions. In so doing, he employed the most recent technology, as we can see here, to slow down recordings and tr to transcribe them. Elements of Hungarian, Eastern European, North African, Turkish folk music was integrated into his music as I have demonstrated in my book on Bartók String Quartets, published by Oxford University Press in 2014. Following Bartók, my own compositional practice integrates ethnomusicological research with various technologies. I will deal more extensively with this uh, relationship between transcription and composition later in this lecture. In 2011, I came to the Netherlands as a visiting professor in the Computing and Information Science Department of Utrecht University to work on a research project funded by the government of the Netherlands focusing on oral culture in the country. 
During my stay in the Netherlands, I started out by recording members of synagogues and mosques across the country. These recordings were then analyzed by a research team. Many of the reciters came from an Indonesian background. Uh, these reciters of Quran recitation uh, were the main teachers in the mosques in Den Haag and Amsterdam. Although all of the students who were taking part in these lessons were not from an Indonesian background. Many of these recitations were based on expert Quran reciters like Haja Maria Ulfa, pictured here. And I'll just play a brief example of Haja Maria Ulfa. I should say that I discovered this during my doctoral studies, um, and I heard her recite, and I really had no idea about Quran recitation, but I was immediately fascinated by her recitation. Um, and we'll hear this. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a recording that's done in Indonesia uh, when it's raining. Uh, uh, so the other important part about Haja Maria Ulfa, she was the 2001 world champion in Quran recitation uh, because there's always a competition in Malaysia and she won this competition. We're going to continue with Surat Al-Qadr, and the sound you hear in the background is the rain. It's the rainy season in Jakarta, and there's not much we can do about that. Surah Al-Qadr dimulai dari ayat 1 sampai selesai. Diawali dengan bacaan murattal. A'udhu billahi minash rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr Wa ma adraka ma laylatul qadr Laylatul qadr khayrun min alf shahr تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العظيم Computational analysis methods developed with my colleagues in Utrecht allowed me to find melodic contours of given Quran recitation performances. With this technology, one can compare contours and frequencies in and across cultural and religious chant traditions. Such integration of ancient traditions is part of my practice, which I called historicized composition. This computational ethnomusicological research also informed my current project integrating 17th century philosophical texts of Baruch Spinoza into a music composition cycle, began as a Guggenheim fellow. This artistic research has been continued in Bergen in the project Sounding Philosophy, which integrates the fields of composition, philosophy, and science. This background gives a sense of where I'm coming as uh, from a compo composer's angle. This also influences how I see the world of composition and contemporary music in 2020. I will now discuss the global situation for composers today and how such a situation presents itself in Norway. Today there is no center of culture, just as elements of the periphery have influenced the formation of new music in the center, today the center and periphery are everywhere. In terms of compositional identity, rather than national identity, hybrid identities represent the new norm. There is an open field of musical possibilities, allowing connections between various working methods, traditions, technologies, as never before. 
there is uh, such a situation has the potential to present a diversity of musical species. In order to understand what music can be today, we also need to look at how listening developed throughout history. One needs to understand how previous generations listened and understand, uh, understood and or misunderstood music. Previous generations listened to music in a functional manner. The saying goes, der Barockhörer weiß, was sich dazu gehört, der klassische Hörer weiß, was sich dazu nicht gehört. The Baroque listener knows what belongs, the classical listener knows what doesn't belong. In developing hearing in the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment music cultures, music became a hermeneutical activity. Music was understood as sounding philosophy, following Beethoven as understood by Adorno. This relates to enlightenment or Selbstverwirklichung and Bildung. Pointing to this possibility of clinging to philosophie, this challenges our preconceived notions of the goals and borders of musical language. There's a diversity of musical cultures and philosophies and contemporary music exists as aesthetic disturbance. Discursive function exists also within democracy in this context. So composers today need to discover and invent a compositional language. This language must simultaneously look forward, being innovative, and simultaneously look backwards having a sense of historical consciousness. New music exists as an alternative to entertainment. It invents itself constantly anew through innovation. And new music is invariably questioning its own categories of musical comprehension and functionality. In terms of composition education, there are various things to keep in mind in terms of knowledge. For instance, traditional knowledge, notation practices, understanding various notation practices. Uh, several of my students are here. Uh, they know how much I torture them uh, with various notation practices. Uh, so also notation practices from a variety of cultures and a variety of traditions, even notation practices that deal with improvisational or semi-improvisational music cultures. Uh, ear training. Uh, so we have one composer today who went through a very rigorous ear training exam uh, in the entrance exam at the Grieg Academy. It's important for composers to hear. Uh, so for myself, I went through many, many years of ear training in Budapest uh, through Kodai Method. I'm very grateful for that experience. And really, combining transcription, ear training, and composition is, is a very useful uh, practice, I find. And finally, score reading. So score reading in terms of being able to understand what's in a score, but also score reading in the traditional sense of being able to play it at the piano. Um, it's very good for our brain yoga uh, to do that. Um, so, indigenous knowledge, uh, how to understand spiritual and intellectual reflection. So, I don't think it's haphazard that uh, what I started uh, working on at Princeton University was a, a dissertation on music and language. And I had originally planned to write a dissertation that dealt with Lachenmann, Fernihau, and Mahler, and all kinds of composers. And then I decided to write a little chapter on chant, and everything else fell away, right? So uh, it got totally thrown out. Uh, so, so, but the question of how spiritual traditions relate to intellectual traditions of composing, reflective traditions, today I think it's very important for us to reconsider these, these questions, also coming from a variety of traditions and standpoints. 
uh, in integrating ancient knowledge. Uh, so not only uh, technology from today, but technology from yesterday. Uh, some things we can use uh, that might have become irrelevant in uh, the meantime. And finally, cultural heritage, uh, which uh, Giri and I have talked about, is very important for me, also in a Norwegian perspective. And various technologies, learning uh, digital technologies, so learning programs like Max or Open Music uh, Live, all of the various technologies that exist, and instrument building, extending instruments with electronics, um, speakers, etc., um, and connecting this traditional knowledge with new technologies. Um, also, there's the question of diversity, uh, which is not only a question of sociological importance, but also aesthetic importance. So, for instance, gender diversity, inclusion of minority communities in composition programs, in our compositional uh, ecosystem is very important. Economic diversity is also very important. Uh, uh, international relations, having uh, students from other countries come into education programs, giving a new impulse uh, can be uh, amazing. Uh, and diverse groups of people create diverse relationships, diverse situations. And I think we have to do our best to increase that diversity. Um, and that brings aesthetic diversity. So bringing in different aesthetic traditions, different aesthetic directions. Uh, so different traditions uh, and different approaches to the field of composition. So in terms of the Norwegian context for music education, um, First, artistic research and education uh, connect, so there's a kind of trickle-up and trickle-down relationship. So, for instance, a PhD student can bring in knowledge about artistic practice that can go across the master's and bachelor's program, and vice versa. We often learn the most from our beginning students. Uh, and creating new musical languages. Actually, the student's job is to create, in my view, their own musical language. It should be specific and individual, and uh, they need to develop this. Um, also, interdisciplinarity and cross-pollination with other fields, other artistic fields, but also other intellectual fields is very important, building an intellectual framework. Um, and at the Greek Academy, we've also dealt with Norwegian traditions. Uh, so connecting the long tradition of important composers, uh, working with Norwegian ensembles, uh, for instance, Bit 20 or Tabula Rasa, and also doing research into Norwegian traditions. We had last year a wonderful project uh, in the Greek Now uh, conference where students looked at Hardegger fiddle transcriptions, Greeks on compositions, and then wrote pieces for piano and electronics based on these, this knowledge. And the pieces were amazing, so they were really uh, very interesting. And at the end, we had Kofi and Gao uh, from Princeton University talk about Edvard Grieg in an African context. So, uh, so such projects also can really inform where we are in terms of our national heritage here. And also for me personally, what's also important and uh, important for many of my students is to study the traditions of the Norwegian minority groups and build that into the curriculum of composition. Um, and national and international relationships are important. So more Fox seminar. Uh, so I really think that this is a small country. We should meet more often, right? We should have more interaction with one another. Uh, it's very important, and I'm really grateful that this is happening today. Um, connections also to Scandinavia. Uh, in Bergen, I initiated the Polly Hall competition for women composers. 
Uh, so we have uh, 26 uh, composers from Scandinavia who applied to this competition. And really, I went to the uh, orchestra thinking they would probably show me the door. Uh, and I was very surprised that they took me up on this initiative. And hopefully, this will be something that will enhance women's contemporary music in Norway and Scandinavia uh, in the future. Uh, also, connections to Europe. Uh, we've had uh, projects with the Neue Kalsalisten, uh, Professor Klaus Stefan Mankov from Leipzig, uh, different groups, uh, and also international dialogues, uh, bringing in speakers and having uh, seminars with Brazil and South Africa. So, in the current context, uh, this also relates to larger social issues of ecological transformation. And I think uh, contemporary composition can present a mode of changing consciousness in terms of cultural ecology, allowing for a different and more ethical relationship in the end to the natural world. And our current situation of social distancing has been experienced in the past also in terms of how composers worked in totalitarian and dictatorial regimes, as expressed in the works of Arnold Schoenberg and Galino Stwolskaya. We have to remember that even now, in the time of pandemic, we must remain creative and create new opportunities. As Schoenberg said, Kunst kommt von müssen, Kunst kommt von müssen, nicht von können. Art comes from necessity, not from ability. So, to challenge society, I believe that new music must continue to be difficult. This has a precedent from earlier times. In response to his critics' definition of his music as excessively dis difficult, Beethoven opined that such musical difficulty was an important aspect of musical performance and reception. Writing to his publisher, Sigmund Anton Steiner, in regard to his piano sonata in A major, Opus 101, he stated, difficult is a relative term. For what seems difficult for one person will seem easy to another. And thus the term says nothing at all. But viewed in a different light, the term says everything. For whatever is difficult is also beautiful, good, great, and so forth. So, yeah, I, I'm just finishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in this way, the goal of new music is also to move consciousness away from sensualism and towards hearing the particular. While new sounds might be attractive, the goal might be to hear old sounds in a new context. As Helmut Lachenmann has stated, every tremolo or interval or tam-tam noise is an and as intensive and new as the context you stimulate for it, to liberate it, for a moment at least, from the historic implications loaded into it. This is the real challenge. It is about breaking the old context by whatever means, to break the sounds, looking into their atavity. Doing this is an incredible experience full of ambivalence I mentioned. You can still see that you knew that sound before, but now it has changed. The creative spirit did something with it. This is the only reason to make music for me, to hear in a new way what you knew before. In this light, new music is not only about making the new, but also must concern itself with questions of memory and history. For me, composition is also a way to research the past and how we remember this past, thereby connecting it to our present and future. Such research connects to our contemporary social and political realities as how, as how we perceive time and space, both as individuals and as a collective, also here in Norway. Through such creative investigations of the past, we might be ever able to better understand our present and future. As Henri Bergson once stated, practically, we perceive only the past, the pure present being the invisible progress of the past gnawing into the future.
I have not measured. I think it's no need to. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting. I'm just see the time running and we have to have time for us three. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, introduction. There is no uh, need to talk about oh, you. Oh, oh. Yes. Yes. To talk more about um, your work, it's, it's really uh, interesting. Uh, everything. Thank you for this great introduction. Uh, I want to uh, focus this conversation a bit around how you how you see the Norwegian music contemporary scene. You came here two years ago, after many years in, in uh, British Columbia, Victoria, and before that you, you lived in Hungary and then in Vienna, where you studied. So, so what is your, your main impression of the Norwegian contemporary music scene compared to the other countries you lived in? Could you say something about that? Um, I think I, I said this before, the question about center and periphery. Um, so in many ways, being in Norway um, also for me relates to uh, my Hungarian experience uh, because uh, also there, uh, there, there are many connections. Uh, for instance, a connection to folk music, uh, a connection um, also how the country is divided uh, even you could say socially isolated between the various cities, um, and also the question of, of history, of how Norwegian history has developed. Obviously, Hungarian history recently has gone in a very dark direction, um, uh, but, uh, but there are many things in which I, I view that. Um, and that being said, I also see, especially for young composers, that uh, there is a type of global awareness. Um, so uh, I, we talked about this before in British Columbia, I would have students who would come to the composition program who would be from a very small village somewhere in Alberta. Uh, and I would say, well, why do you want to study composition? And they say, well, I was on YouTube and I discovered this piece of Oh, in Stockhausen called Kazan de Juli, uh, and uh, at the end, and they had no idea what it was, uh, but something intrigued them about that. And I think that such accidents happen all the time. Um, and uh, just like my accident with Maria Ulfa, that has completely changed my view of music. Um, so, so those type of types of uh, accidents, and I guess. As an educator, my goal is to allow accidents to happen, right? So, uh, interesting accidents, uh, life-changing accidents. Um, interesting you mentioned that about the Gisanda Yuligi, because I heard uh, a guy talking about this exact phenomenon on, uh, on YouTube, that people listen to whatever, hip-hop music or anything, and then it's like suggestions on the side, mm -hmm. and then it's a Stockhausen or something that is kind of related, but they would never find yes. it. It's yes. like, and yeah, I experienced this myself yes. as well. It's like, you, you should listen to this. A bit frightening that the machine knows me so well. <laughs> That's another discussion. Uh, but what, would, could you say something about, because Bergen, for me, is, is um, has always been a city where the contemporary uh, music yeah, scene is, is very interesting and very alive and uh, I know there are some people from Bergen here but uh, I, I have this impression that there are more people experimenting working together I don't know is, is this correct opinion uh, do you did you experience this in Bergen that people are like uh, would you curious yes in the contemporary music arts and that, uh, that's kind of uh, not uh, not considering genre but whatever genre they're in they they need to work together. Yes, yes. So I guess this is the other part. I mean, definitely, there's something in the water in Bergen. And in Bergen, we have a lot of water. So, uh, uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's really the case that there is an, an ecosystem for, for culture that somehow works. Um, but we also know as composers, um, you know, we have Different, uh, different institutions. 
So we have uh, the small institutions, we have the large institutions, we have the opera, we have uh, festival, or we have the orchestra, and then we have what I would call the subversive institutions. Uh, so the underground institutions, or or the the institutions that you know, some way operate more autonomously. Uh, and I think that's part of the tension of being a composer is, you know, some of these are, it's institutions don't actually fit all of our needs. Um, and we actually need to create new institutions and new working methods. And I think that's what happens in Bergen is that people accidentally meet one another and create working situations, um, and it's small enough and kind of, you know, hoogly enough uh, that, that that can happen. And I've also heard because of the rain, that's an English woman living on my island, thought I'm from just south of Bergen, she says that you have to be very spontaneous when you're living in those conditions, oh. because you have to kind of act. Uh, when the sun is shining, you have to go on a mountain, you know, you have to kind of... Uh, Take your possibility to do something. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. It, maybe that's why we have such an improvisational. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> have to just play. But 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 consider, uh, if you consider it to like I, I I talked a bit about this because I I, I know a few Canadian composers from different parts of Canada, yeah. and I know that in British Columbia there is a strong Mandelweiser tradition. Is that right? Yes. It's some parts. Yeah. Some parts, yeah. yes. And also, also in I know that in Quebec you have very, very strong like mixed music or technology-based arts in general scene. Um, is that very different? Do you think if, when you meet students in Norway, or is it kind of because of the YouTube and the global that we kind of find our friends uh, <laughs> across the world? Across it's not the world. so separated into countries. Maybe it's more. Yeah, I would actually say it's more of the latter. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's definitely, and even in this whole pandemic situation. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, so I see two things uh, within that um, that people people are forced to communicate in a different way globally, um, in some ways, and as composers, for me personally. Uh, the score becomes even more important. Um, so, because especially now that I'm writing a piece based on text of Spinoza, that Spinoza could not publish during his lifetime. And he knew he could not publish it. So he knew he had to die before these texts could be published. Because it was too controversial. It was too controversial. Right? So, um, uh, comparing God and nature, it's very con controversial. Right? So, um, so that's that's for me uh, something that's that's very important. Now it actually focuses our energy on reflection um, in terms of how people interact. Yeah, of course you have different like schools or or developments that happen among groups, but um, but I think there's perhaps less of that. Than in the past. So, in the past, you had you know the first BME school and the second BME school, etc. I'm not so sure that that's so. Uh, that's the way of being for composers. No, my, my impression yeah. is also that younger composers, younger than me, are more open to to various techniques and like so whatever it is. It's it's the tool you have more like a, more like a visual artist would work. You know, for this I would work with this material and. If I use loudspeakers or not, if I write for ensembles or not, it's like more blurred, maybe. Um, and also, I know that you also did all of those things, but uh, but um, yeah, I, I think also the the, the what do you call it, Mühle hat in some Yeah, the yeah, it's, possibilities. It's, possible it's yeah. cheaper to to get whatever you need to make something that's quite amazing, you know, use of. Yeah. It's not like you have to have a huge studio. This has been going for some years, but it's interesting to see that the new generation is um, is more um, open-minded. I think uh, I had this impression to to work in different genres or methods or whatever you would call it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I alluded to this. I think it's, in a sense, dialectical, mm -hmm. uh, because um, we have these new technologies, and it's, you know, it's very easy to make an interesting sound, right? But, uh, but really, in the end, what's more boring than an interesting sound, right? So, uh, uh, so really, we need to also uh, figure out, well, what is the deeper meaning of this? Uh, what is, how does it actually relate to other things, mm -hmm. and, uh, other aspects of culture, of reflection? Um, so, uh, so again, um, uh, I think, uh, some traditional knowledge. I don't think it's a question of either traditional no. knowledge or, you know, or these these new possibilities, but actually to combine them. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what I think yeah. I, I yeah. see among you. Yes. A lot of young composers, but you have a kind of a uh, whatever starting point you have. Yeah. So you use the tools, and you, yeah, it's, yeah. it's because I uh, that leads me to the next question because. Is there anything you would say, if you think back, like 10 years, is there anything you can see that has been changing oh. uh, in the contemporary music art scene? I, I guess there is a whole lot of things to talk about, but is there any kind of main um, changes you have seen? Uh, yeah. Internationally, maybe, yeah. at first? Since you've been there for two years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I can say from the Canadian perspective in, in Canada. So I had many students from Brazil or from Iran or from China or from everywhere. And they came to look for something that in a way went beyond the education that they received in their home country. But at the same time, there was always this necessity to connect that education and connect their traditions to uh, the knowledge. And I think that's the situation for, for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to, uh, in a way, discover ourselves, but perhaps we also discover ourselves through the other, mm -hmm. through, through having these um, relationships that are unexpected. Yeah, because you also talked about this knowledge of the past, like in Norway, I, I, I just told Daniel that I was in the Reform 94 in the high school in Norway, so I actually learned about Jörg and Norwegian folk music. Maybe it was because I had an amazing teacher, she was a singer and very interested in everything of this, so, so I felt that she, she kind of learned us this so small part of it, of course, but it was there. But maybe it's, you know, we are not asked to, 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 to learn Sami in school. Maybe it should be a, a possibility at least to, 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 to I don't know, it's, it's something about knowing yeah, where you come from and, and, uh, and just, uh, it, it's maybe your ASLB is knowing that be, be, be a safe in where you, your, your past is. But it's something about the tradition uh, that we maybe not see that much. There are some young folk musicians that are really working now towards contemporary music and as you said they're using the tuning systems of the Yellow Field and I know, know a lot of composers in this room also have worked with folk musicians so it, it gives something else uh, and it gives a very, I, I would say, a character to maybe that's the contemporary music of Norway <laughs> in the next, to, to kind of dig into this uh, soundscapes. Yes. It's it's the ecology. It's it's also uh, so in that sense, cultural heritage is part of. It's related to to the cultural ecology uh, of the the region, and um, and I think in part composers can be conservationists in a certain sense. Uh, so not only creative, but also uh, holding memory. Uh, so that's, it's, it's possible, um, and for that uh, reason, a certain openness and also self-reflection is, is necessary. Yeah, because you mentioned that you came into this lament. Yes. 
when you transcribed at the science yes, uh, yes, department yes. Yeah, in Budapest. So that was kind of something, the work you did, and then it, it learned you about a tradition. Yes. Uh, that became so, very important. Yes. Uh, yeah, so as I said, I, if someone would have told me um, as I started my PhD studies that I would be writing a dissertation on <coughs> the Hungarian laments, the Jewish Torah trope, uh, St. Gal and plain chant, and Quran recitation, I would have laughed at them. So, uh, because I had no interest in that, really, or I had interest in lament, I had interest, but I didn't know that it would become such an important part of, uh, of composing. Yeah. Well, I also like, we talked yesterday, and, and Daniel had this very nice uh, way, uh, way of saying that uh, you looked at the composer as a as an architect, not a carpenter. Yeah. It's not like either either, but it's something like you, you build your own uh, environment, and maybe that's the thing I see in more younger composers, that they they find people to work with. I, I think, uh, you can correct me from the Music Academy in Oslo, but this, they have this subject where they improvise uh, folk music, jazz, and classical music. They have this improvisation classes, and I, I think that when you when you have these meetings and you see these other ways of working and then you have the composition students working with them, you maybe get a look into to another way of thinking and working, uh, which I think is important to, to learn. I didn't, I didn't know about this myself as a, as a student, so I see that this is an important thing to, yeah, to, to know about. Uh, I said that we would open to questions and I will uh, keep my promise if anyone has any questions or comments and I know that some people were a bit skeptical about talking into those mics and that's fine uh, if you want to ask Daniel something, if you want to say something or, yeah, so please, we have maybe three yeah, minutes. Yeah, <laughs> Ja, jag hör väldigt gott. Ja. Ja, så på norska så följer helt gott. Och... Ja. Ja. Jag har en fråga om att du är intresserad av chans. Finns det någonting om pitch som är annorlunda i olika parts? Many things. Yes, because I, I hear some diversion in pitches in different cities. Examples. Yes, yes. Um, so, for instance, uh, in Quran recitation, uh, a primary uh, parameter is pronunciation, timing, uh, mouth placement, tongue placement throat, uh, how the throat is, is expressed. Um, what's really not a primary consideration is pitch, right? So, so of course, they, there's an employment of makam, of the scales, of the Arabic scales in Quran recitation, but um, uh, no one would uh, stop anyone from reciting if they were to change the maqam, but if they were to change the pronunciation or change the timing, this would be a giant change, or, or uh, it would be a mistake in that sense. Um, so, uh, and that's something that I looked at uh, in terms of how music develops. So, for instance, in Hungarian laments, I have many examples of laments, so in Hungarian, uh, a lament is called a shirato, which shirato means crying, crying song. And if you, the, the peasant women would always say, they wouldn't say, I sing my crying song. They would say, el tam, a shirato. So I said my shirato, my, my lament. So it's not, it's not singing, it's speaking. And often I have several examples where a, a woman will start to talk about a relative and say, Yai kedves nagy lány, 
Jaj, mennyit ment fel te, kedves Magdalene. And then after a while they start crying, and then they start singing, and that goes into a melody. But there's no differentiation between speaking and singing in that sense. Uh, and even with uh, Torah recitation, the, the word for Torah recitation is, is ta me hamikra, which means the, uh, the sense of the reading, but it's being sung. Uh, so again, it's not even music. So, so all of these <coughs> categories, even though we might view it as music, it's actually not, doesn't have primarily a musical function. I mean, we, we have in, in Gregorian chant, the uh, cantus, right? Which is singing. Uh, so there, uh, there's, there's a change, but even there, with the nooms, with the early nooms, um, we know that, uh, that uh, for instance, gesture and time and pronunciation were more important than pitch because the pitches, even though they were used, the systems were established much later than the first notation. So we have, yeah, we have uh, uh, the St. Gallens, so they only show the gesture of the melody. Yeah. And there are giant uh, uh, fights that go on among play chant scholars about when the actual melodies started to become solidified. Uh, so, so that question of pitch, yeah, we we did lots of we have a database of lots of Quran recitation, of lots of Torah trope, even now of noom uh, of noom uh, recitations, and we've looked at how pitch actually develops across time. Yeah, it's, it's very complicated, but it's, uh, uh, you know, we, I think, are fixated on pitch. So Lachman, when he was teaching at Princeton, he called the composers pitch bulls because uh, <laughs> they were all so fixated on pitch. Right? Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, but, but it's only one parameter. <laughs> That's a famous last, uh, that's a very uh, <laughs> nice uh, way of uh, saying it, pitch, pitch ball. Pitch ball. Oh, I would remember yeah. that. <laughs> pitch ball. I will say, uh, we have three questions. Uh, um, how, could we take those three? Is that okay? We, I know that we are running a bit over time. Yeah. yeah. Short questions, short answers. <laughs> I don't know who were first. Both. I just have a, a question about the polit political situation right now in Hungary. What ramifications does that situation have on contemporary music? Is the music different now? Oh, yeah, you want a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Answer that, long answer after. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I, 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 often, uh, um, I often don't even want to talk about the situation in Hungary because often I find that if I really say what the reality is, people look at me like I'm talking about a Kafka uh, novel. So, uh, like, a, like a Kafka novel, uh, because, yeah, it has an enormous... Influence. So, for instance, um, now uh, it's, um, the opera director, because it has been obviously a long time kicked out, all of the cultural institutions, if you're not in alignment with the government, um, uh, you, you won't get a position in you know, halls or um, uh, in all kinds of ways. And, and for myself, um, every time, uh, the few times that my music in Hungary has been played, there needs to be a half a year discussion ahead of time where, in which hall it can be actually played because, um, yeah, because someone is, you know, maybe it doesn't fit into the uh, government's plan 
or a government's ideology. So it's, it's an ideolog ideological cultural situation. Um, so they're, they're making it so that it's, it's, a, um, it's a nationalist uh, cultural situation. Um, and basically for contemporary music, uh, it's very difficult for the people who stay. We have a giant brain drain also uh, from the country. So a lot of composers have left the country, um, including myself. So, um, so it's, it's a very bizarre but does it change the music that is being composed today? Uh, you know, uh, so hun Hungary is a strange place in this way because um, uh, we had a very creative time during dictatorships or during during uh, during socialism. Uh, so we had actually a very you know great uh, tradition uh, in that time, and now. To, and even today, uh, for instance, a few years ago, I commissioned a piece that actually became, uh, it was banned, uh, this piece. Uh, we couldn't actually perform it openly because uh, it, the topic of the piece was too difficult. It was even supported by the European Union, and we couldn't openly uh, perform the piece um, uh, by a great Hungarian composer, Andrea Sigurdvari. So, so yeah, it, it's it's a it's a bizarre, very very strange uh, situation. Uh, okay, Yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned that in global music today, uh, the new norm is a hybrid identity. Uh, what you said is is true. Composers of all ages, and could you also mention some benefits and maybe problems uh, with this? With hybrid identity? Mm. It, it's a problem, but it's an interesting problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so uh, the best thing for composers are to have interesting problems. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think, yeah, again, I don't know much about composition in North Korea, but uh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> there, maybe, you know, maybe that could be problematic hybrid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I don't know. It's very uh, hit, well hidden. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's a hidden hybrid yeah. identity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, even look at Bartok. Bartok was a hybrid identity. So, uh, absolutely. Uh, so um, it, it's something that's just made a giant crescendo across the 20th into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a tendency for any specific ages. It's something that's saturated through the whole, uh, yeah, world composers. Yeah, well, um, you could even look at composers, for instance, like Chelsea. Um, uh, so is Chelsea an Italian composer? Right? Uh, I'm not so certain. Right? So uh, yeah, it's it's uh, so maybe even in that sense, uh, composers might actually discover something of themselves that transcends national or. Identity. Identity is a. It, it, people ask me uh, recently in Quebec about that. I had to take part in a panel discussion called "What is your musical DNA?" And so they, they they were expecting me to say something, and I told them, you know, when people talk about identity, I get very nervous. So um, so again, I, maybe maybe it's not something to define. Yeah. And it changes. It changes, yeah. I think we have to. Oh, sorry, Eva. I, I, Eva, yes, thank you. Oh, what's your name? Yes. So it's uh, about where you began with Bartok and his uh, 
listening to music, pop music, and transcribing them. And I've thought about that, let's say, the connection to what's happened perhaps the last 10, 20, 30 years with people collecting sounds around. And I've often, often thought about that uh, I have now shadows of time mm. that's actually I can listen to the same place from 1984, yes. 94, 2004, and, and this comes into the mystical, metaphysical yes. <laughs> part yes. because I'm listening to people that are dead. Absolutely. They don't yeah. exist. Mm. And I think that's a big mental change that's happening yes. now, and it's really interesting. Mm. And I think perhaps that it's very important that some people dare to do this kind of dip into mm. something. So, thank yes. you for your... Yes, thank you for this wonderful and, comment. Yeah. And I was also thinking that as you say this, because I remember when it was a lockdown, when it was kind of now, it's locking down, everything is closed. I thought, why didn't I record more cafes? <laughs> with people talking and eating and drinking and whatever sounds. <laughs> you have them, of course you have. <laughs> I'm very thankful that you have, because it was like, of course, we should have all of those now, because it's going to be gone, you know. So. Exactly. I've done this also often, where I record, make a convolution recording of a historical space, and that is the basis for uh, a piece. Um, yeah. So also the you know the people who are not there yeah. can still be there in a certain sense, uh, or or one investigates that. Um, yeah. And also when you speak, I, I use my there is another certain voice and it speaks, and then I ask who is speaking, who mm -hmm. is talking. Yeah. Is that the that you really? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so maybe we should collect more sounds. That's the end of the, the, I'll wrap it up with that. Collect sounds and collect spaces. Yes. And check out Alexander Riesek's PhD project. He's collecting empty spaces. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Exactly. Thank you, yeah, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for asking us to talk. Although we used more time than we, than we had. That's always like this when you start. Thank you.